Welcome in. We are here with another episode of The Red Pill. Today we are focusing on cancer research with Drs. O'Day and Dr. Fox. I'm DJ Ski. This is done in conjunction with our friends at Providence St. Joseph Health. And um, let's get this started just talking about what the work you guys are doing with Providence St. Joseph Health around cancer research um, involves. So I think the trans, uh, the effort that we have at uh, Actually, in Portland, Oregon, when the Child's Research Institute, and there are similar efforts going on at the John Wayne, involve doing good basic research in, in cancer and then translating those findings into patients with cancer. And, and then that's a major part of what we're trying to do. So it's looking at taking advantage of all these breakthroughs in the science and the technology, a better mm-hmm. understanding of how uh, cancer works and how cancer turns off the immune system, mm-hmm. and then finding the, the ways to, to partner with pharmaceutical companies where we can to get access to those drugs to do really innovative trials, not just the same trials that other people are offering, but some really innovative trials. Yeah. And I think that's really a, a hot part of, of what our institute does up in Portland. Yeah, I mean, I think Providence St. Joseph's is a large, you know, 50 uh, hospital cancer system, um, but we're community-based, and yet we have these hubs of true research excellence around diseases and immunotherapy is one of the areas of cancer research that's front and center, really a revolution of of cancer Mm -hmm. care and both the Portland Center and the John Wayne Cancer Institute in Los Angeles here have really been part of this immune research from early days, meaning when it wasn't that front and center. Mm -hmm. So we're enjoying being put in the limelight now and helping translate uh, these discoveries to patients and educate our physicians around the world on sort of the value of research and how they've really impacted lives of patients with cancer. Yeah, now let's, let's talk about more about what uh, immunotherapy that you, that you guys are talking about. And it seems like a lot of people are talking about these days. What, what is immunotherapy for, for our listeners out there? So it turns out that you know, we have trillions of cells in our bodies that are constantly turning over and making mistakes and mutations and little cancers are probably developing all of us all the time. And it turns out our immune systems are hugely successful at seeing these abnormalities eradicating them at an early stage. This was not felt to be the, uh, the way things were even a few decades ago, but, but the point is as you age, your immune system weakens, as you, you're stressed, as you have medical conditions that suppress your immune system, now the immune system's handicapped a bit and cells can start to evade the immune system, establish cancer, and then spread. And so all these new immunotherapy treatments are really about how do we resurrect an exhausted immune system, and particularly this this worker horse cell called the T cell, and how do you make it, give it its strength back so that it can see the cancers as foreign and eradicate. And the beauty is, not only does it prevent early cancers theoretically, but even people with widespread cancers, these patients are being cured with with these new T cell directed therapies. Wow. And I would say, you know, if you look back at the history of medicine, the biggest breakthrough in medicine was the development of vaccines. And so that's led to more prevention of disease and more uh, life-saving impact at a very low cost um, over time. And so if you think of cancer, the future is going to be using that same immune system that we use to fight uh, an infectious disease, use that immune system to actually turn it on, rev it up, and have it either eliminate the cancer or prevent the cancer from coming out. Wow, so you're, you're saying that um, with immunotherapy, it's not just, I guess, uh, uh, you know, fixing the cancer, it's before it even starts correctly, yeah, right? Yeah, we, we know certain like viruses that predispose, HPV is a virus cause cervical yeah. cancer, but also oral cancers, and particularly in younger people associated with this virus. And so we now have abilities to suppress and prevent, vaccinate against a virus that then can cause. We know some other uh, 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 diseases also are virally mediated. So that's just one example Amazing. of how viruses can be used. Another example is, is technology that was developed actually at the Child's Research Institute in Portland is for a new type of vaccine technology. And that was technology that was spun out into a biotech. And the, that technology may allow us to make vaccines for cancers that are not virally originated. So there's, there's this whole strategy of what we might be able to do to take things that are commonly overexpressed that, that are present by cancer. And the, and the NCI has identified more than 70 of these different targets in cancer, and they've prioritized those for development of cancer vaccine technology. But, but these, tech, these vaccines that were developed now, we've got 
hundreds of, of, of targets that are commonly overexpressed in many cancers. And the idea is that we can hopefully induce immunity against these and prevent cancer from coming out in patients. But right now, those studies are going on. We just have a trial in lung cancer, one in prostate cancer, and one soon to launch in triple negative breast cancer that will take this vaccine technology with other immune stimulants and checkpoint blockers, so these things that take the breaks off the immune system so it's more effective, combining those together to treat patients. Wow, so is all this immunotherapy, is this available now for patients? Is it only in trial mode? No, absolutely, front and center right now across really? melanoma was sort of the prototype disease that these immune drugs came onto the market. But now I think there's 15 cancers in adults where we have wow. active immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's replacing chemotherapy really? in, in, in many cancers or is being used in conjunction. So right now we are front and center in most adult count cancers actually. And so because I have very light skin, is, <laughs> should I be like taking if there's immunotherapy to prevent <laughs> skin cancer before? Because it's more likely in my <laughs> lifetime that I'll get there. How, like what should I, I do now? Is, I'm like excited, I'm like, wait, is this a cure? Like breaking it down for, for our audience. So we would rather prevent than cure, right? Okay. Uh, so the most important message is uh, sun exposures, ultraviolet lights, mm -hmm. melanoma in, in light skin, Caucasians particularly, uh, that's the biggest risk factor. And it's the sun you get as a child, actually, that sets you up 20, 30 years later. For it. So the cat may be out of the bag to a extent, but you need to have good skin exams <laughs> because catching melanoma early uh, can lead to cure. But even if it were to get very advanced, uh, you know, just 10 years ago, the average survival once melanoma had spread out to the internal organs was about six months. Now the average survival is about three and a half years and about half of patients are being cured of their widespread. Wow. So, and that's primarily immunotherapy, not exclusively. But so, so the key, key is we are making tremendous strides in treating advanced cancer. So, so that term cure though, it's, it's, it's a hard one to be using, right, in patients because these new immunotherapies we won't know for a long time if they're in fact curing patients. But we do believe that immunotherapy can cure patients based on data that was generated in clinical trials in the 1980s. So 84, 85, 86, there were patients that were treated when I was a fellow at the NCI, were treated and are disease free today. It's about more than 34 years. So that's when we're starting to think, and their cancer never came back. Those patients were cured. Why, did, right? why does it take so long, if you're talking 1984, 85, 86, for this to, to actually now be something that we're talking about in 2018? Well, it, it has ups and, ups and downs. And in fact, in, in those cases, in those patients that were treated, it was a 5 to 7% of patients had what we call a complete response, where all their cancer appeared to be gone. Uh, the vast majority of patients didn't see a beneficial effect. But it's been through hard work of basic researchers and translational people over the last several decades understanding the mechanism of action, right? Why did the patient who had that complete response and all their tumor melted away, why were they cured? And what happens in the other patients? And so technology that we have and that both the John Wayne has and Providence has at, at the Charles Research Institute, we have technology today that can actually take a sample of blood from a patient and actually monitor what's happening in their immune system. So it's sort of, imagine like tip and balance, right? Mm -hmm. That you get on this new drug and, and your, your, your immune system is getting revved up and it's getting turned on, but then all of a sudden it starts coming down again. If you're not looking at it, if you're just doing a black box clinical trial where you give patient agent X and you're just not looking at their blood system or not looking at their immune system, then you don't know that. But if you're tailoring, if you're looking at the patients and following it, you'll say, hey, that patient needs this. It needs X, Y, and Z, right? And, and that's, the kind of, that's the kind of the new trials, and that's our understanding that's at the forefront of where the field is today, of being able to do this. And it isn't at many centers, and that's one of the places that only, limited places in the continent, right, can do that. Wow. But those are kinds of studies that are done, and they've got to be done mostly in collaboration with large pharma. So the Providence Health System is part of the BMS Immuno-Oncology Network, mm -hmm. which brings in the, the data there. It also brings in the, the NCI with the, the Cancer Immunotherapy Trials Network. We're part of that. So there's other opportunities. The, and, and the John Wayne is also involved with other research groups and other clinical trials co organizations. We talked a lot about T cells, which are the workhorse of the immune system, but it turns out that there are many other immune cells. It's an orchestra basically being conducted. Your immune system is a symphony of, of cells that are interacting. And clearly the T cell is the primary driver cell that is, should eradicate anything that's foreign, particularly okay. viruses and cancers. But there are many other cells that are in battle to suppress the T cells. And so our understanding at the basic level of how the orchestra of the immune system works and how it's conducted will allow us to find new drugs that suppress other cells 
that may be interfering with the T cell response. And so that's leading to what we call combination immunotherapy trials, where they're not just T cell directed treatments, but we're adding to those T cell directed treatments, other treatments that are affecting other cells, natural killer cells or suppressor cells. There's lots of different cells in the symphony. It's really cool. Now, so for, for the average uh, person, uh, wh what would be the difference between, with what we're talking about with immunotherapy and chemotherapy? So chemotherapy is really directed at cells, or any cell that's dividing. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very specific cell mediated approach to the malignancy. Um, the immune therapies, where we're not completely ignoring the malignancy, we are essentially getting off the malignancy and getting on to the immune cell. And now it turns out the nature, the genetics, the genomics of the cancer may be a huge part of why the immune cells may see it or not as foreign. So it's not that we're completely ignoring the cancer, but it's very clear that there are immune cells that are not doing their job, and so we're focusing more on the immune system directly than the cancer directly. But clearly, there's a symbiosis here. Yeah. And I'm assuming that uh, immunotherapy obviously has a lot less side effects than, than chemotherapy. Different, but, um, but in general, more tolerable. I would say patients on immune therapy generally can live their life more normally than patients on chemotherapy. With chemotherapy, because it's attacking any dividing cell, the, your hair, you, a lot of, often there's hair loss or mouth sores or other GI mm -hmm. problems. With immune therapy, sometimes as we rev up these T cells, they can cause inflammation to other body sites. So, and some of these can be very serious and even life-threatening and rarely it can cause death of the patient yeah. just by activating a very powerful immune system. But we have other drugs that can suppress that immune system if it gets overactive. So the, on the clinical level, it's sort of an, yeah. an artistic sort of balance of T cells going after the tumor, but not allowing them to overdo it on normal tissues. It's so much more complex than I think we, I guess just as people just think like, oh yeah, there's just a cure, here's what you take. There's a lot of, it's almost like an art, I guess, in trying to find this balance, it sounds like in talking with you guys. Do you think um, immunotherapy has the ability to potentially um, eliminate the need for chemotherapy in the future, or is this something where they both will um, operate under different circumstances or potentially even together? I think for some cancers that's true. I mean, for Hodgkin's disease, I mean, that's mm -hmm. one of the examples where immunotherapy is probably going to take over. And, 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 but it's unknown, it's unclear right now for which diseases. Like look at melanoma, another great yeah. example. There are some cancers for which the combination of chemotherapy with immunotherapy is actually also very effective. Wow. And so that's being identified for, for non-small cell lung cancer, for instance, which is the most common cancer on the planet, right? It claims so more I, lives. I think in the, in the past, we gave chemotherapy till the end, and it was, okay. you know, we wore patients down. And I think what we're learning, like Bernie said, I think there are some diseases where we won't need chemo at all, but there will be other diseases where we will use just brief exposures to the chemo mm -hmm. to break the tumor up, make it bleed a little bit, make it look more visible to the immune cells. And lung cancer may be a disease where sometimes the chemo with the immune drugs are actually are going to be more effective than either alone. And we're also finding out that in, in some cases, for instance, breast cancer, that, that it looks like the earlier you go with the, mm -hmm. with the immunological checkpoint, the more effective that drug is. And so you want to get into the early, the first or second line therapy probably mm -hmm. in patients with advanced breast cancer before the, 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 the side effects of chemotherapy of, of knocking out your immune system might have an impact. And still, I'm assuming with all of these treatments, the best way to, to I guess, especially get a long-term cure is early identification, pretty much, much amongst every different type of cancer. Sure. I mean, that, that's true. That's absolutely true. And I will just say that it, it, when you do that early identification, that's going to take off the tumor burdens. So you're going to reduce yeah. how much tumor the person has. But the advantage there, too, is that you can start to study that tumor when it comes out to see, is their immune system turned on or not? So even if you catch it, and this is work that we just reported in Lancet a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. but if you catch it early, but there's no immune system turned on, those patients are going to do badly, and they need more. They probably need to go on to a clinical trial, versus if you've caught them early and they've got minimal, they had very small disease, and their immune system was turned on. We think those patients are going to do very well. So they should still be followed, but those are some some of the advantages to being able to catch the cancer early. So we have a lot of diseases in which we we find it relatively early, like Bernie said, we remove it, have our surgeons remove it, then some of those have a very good prognosis and it'll never come back. And then others, despite being a, melanoma is a great example, tiny little cancer, but it can have 
uh, tremendous ability to come back even after it's been. Wow. So we need better tools to understand when we take out that primary, what is the chance it's really going to come back or not? Yeah. And will manipulating the immune system earlier? And in melanoma, we now have data that in high risk primary melanoma, once it's been removed and the lymph nodes have been removed, using the immune drugs actually reduces the risk it'll come yeah. back. So wow. we're, we're making progress as immune treatment to prevent early cancers from spreading as well as treating the more advanced cancers. And we're, when, we're talk, when we're talking um, early identification, how early are we talking typically for cancer? Do you need to, I mean, obviously the sooner the better, but what is considered early? Is it a year, three months, like how much time? And how should people out there be checking? And, and obviously yeah. everybody's different based <laughs> off of their, you know, everything from skin tone to genetics and what they should be looking for. Is there a simple, I guess, path for our listeners out there um, that just wanna make sure that they're okay? What should they be doing to make sure that they don't have these things and can identify them early? How do they identify them easily? So depending on your age and your health status, mm -hmm. obviously uh, cancer traditionally is more a disease of aging. Uh, the big four, obviously, as you get older are colon cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. But younger people are more susceptible to certain other cancers. Melanoma is particularly is a, is a cancer that affects people at 30s, 40s, and 50s. So it's all about doing things, having an established doctor, doing screening tests for some cancers have been successful, other screening tests have, haven't. But in terms of can you, uh, despite screening, can you actually reduce your risk of developing a cancer? Other than melanoma and obviously sunscreens and avoiding tanning beds, the other cancers it's really about uh, having a normal body weight, exercising, reducing alcohol, not smoking, simple things. Yeah, you know, eating things, healthy. Yeah. Eating healthy, stress reduction, all those things. Uh, obesity, tobacco, and alcohol are probably the three biggest reversible contributors of cancer as you age. So early behavioral modifications will go a long way to helping you. That's incredible. Now, uh, there's no real test though that the people out there could be like, I just wanna take a blood test right now and see if I have any cancer or something. There's nothing like that. And, and where are we in terms of, I guess, identification and we're, we're, we've been talking about some of the, the prevention and um, treatment so far. Where are we with early, like, I guess, identification in terms of technology for that with cancer? I think there are some technologies, and one of them is has been spun out of the Institute for Systems Biology. It's the Aravail program, and, and that's still, it's into the future, it's focused on wellness. But I think one of the visions that Dr. Lee Hood has had is to have a, that kind of a blood test, right? That you could take a, a blood sample, put it into your cell phone, and get your result, right? That's that's the future vision, right? Yeah. And I think those things are coming because there's there are new, uh, there are now chip-type assays that will let you determine whether or not there's a certain protein in your blood or your serum. That's almost a little bit science fiction, right? It's not here today, it's coming, it's the future. But those tests are not out there. The ones you know about like PSA with the, the, for, for men with prostate cancer, that's a test that people do. But, but those other tests are coming, but they're not here yet. In people with advanced cancer, we can actually take blood and see circulating tumor cells in their bloodstream. Yeah. And in some diseases, we're starting to monitor their response to treatment based on how those cells are. But it's even, and even in early cancers, you can pick up these cells in the bloodstream, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna cause cancer yeah. in when it's early, and that's because the immune system may get rid of it. So we have got a ways to go, but we're clearly moving towards having a blood test picking up early cancer. It's so much more in depth just talking with you guys than you ever even realize or imagine. You just think it's so much simpler. It's Dr. O'Day and Dr. Fox up here. It's the Red Pill on Dash Radio in conjunction with Providence St. Joseph Health. We'll be right back. We are back with Red Pill on Cancer Research. I'm DJ Ski, joined by Dr. Fox and Dr. O'Day in conjunction with Providence St. Joseph Health. So um, what are the key areas of cancer research? And the big question that everybody wants to know, um, in your guys' opinion, is there an actual cure on the horizon for cancer? I, I think the biggest area in oncology, in, in medicine really, is, is the immune system and understanding it better and its impact on on cancer and the ability to prevent cancer and potentially treat cancer. That's, those are the biggest, the biggest blockbuster drug of all time in oncology will be these checkpoint blockade agents that are now out there. There are seven, eight different companies with those drugs. Those work by taking the immune system that breaks off the immune system. So, and let the cancer, the, the immune system that's already been turned on fight and destroy the cancer. So 
that's a really a big a big area for us, right, to, to be studying. And so, as, as, as Dr. Day was saying earlier, there, there are other components of the immune system. And there's other ways that the immune system or the cancer can turn off the immune system. And it's by the, the research that we're doing with looking at the molecular characterization of the cancer, work that's been done with circulating tumor cells that are coming out of the, of the John Wayne and, and Dr. David Hoon, who's there, really a pioneer in studying the circulating tumor cells as well as the, the, the other centers in the, in the, uh, in the, in the Providence St. Joseph system who are trying to do clinical translational research. I think the, uh, the other big area that, that, that's going on is, is how to tailor the immune system so that, or tailor the treatment for the patient so you can take advantage of what's missing or to, to take advantage of what else the cancer has got that we haven't recognized yet. And that's the work that's being done again in the, in the health system, what really led by, by Carlo Bifuco to do the whole exome sequencing of patients' tumors, to try and get all that done so we can get this genetic information and having the bioinformatics people and teams for the health system that can identify that for a given patient. So that, I think, is a big part of the, of the future. I think, you know, in melanoma, about 50% of the low-hanging fruit is the 50% of patients who, who seem to respond to these exhausted immune cells that are then resurrected. In other cancers, it's probably 20 or 30 percent. So what Bernie's talking about, I think that the field has taken care of the low-hanging fruit across a number of diseases, which is great. Yeah. That wasn't there 10 years ago. And these are long-term durable uh, uh, remissions. Uh, but there's plenty of work to be done on tailoring why the others are not responding to the immune nodes, what we call cold tumors, tumors that don't have hot T cells in them. And, and is it because there are other cells, immune cells that are in the way or what it is? But we're gonna, we're gonna crack that nut in the next uh, decade. And it's all gonna be based on understanding the, the translation of the genetics of the cancer and the viability of each individual immune system and marrying the two with treatments that support that. I think we will have personalized uh, yeah. treatment coming to cancer in the next decade. And I think one of the other components of this that we didn't appreciate is by, by looking at, you know, Steve mentioned about the trillion cells you've got in your body that are immune cells. We now have the ability to look at what each of those, what receptors they have on their surface, mm -hmm. right? And the receptor is what is like the lock and key. It's how that, that T cell can recognize the cancer or how that B cell makes an antibody to kill to fight the cancer. Now we can look in, and we can look at patients and say, oh, you've got a great repertoire. You've got, you've got a gazillion potential T cells that are there that can fight your cancer. But there are other people who have got Oh, not so many. I mean, they've got a lot of virus, uh, T cells against a certain virus, but they don't have many T cells left. So their, yeah. their bank account of T cells is not very big. So we're going to have to take those patients and do other types of treatments. And I think one of the other examples of that is this kind of genetically engineering T cells that can go back into patients. So one of the other uh, team members we have in, in Portland is Dr. Eric Tran, who trained with Steve Rosenberg at the NCI and brings with him a whole uh, toolbox of other technologies that are being applied to go after epithelial cancers. And that's his focus, is really trying to find those other epithelial cancers and develop T cells that you could then just infuse into the patient um, to try and fight their cancer. So it sounds like, you know, there's, you know, the potential for, for I guess, cures in the horizon in, in, in our lifetime. Question, in terms of the research that goes into that, so say if I identified what, you know, ultimately is the cure for, for cancer, and it's right here in, in this little pill, mm -hmm. how long will that take to red go pill. through? It's a red pill. It's the red pill. See, I like that. You're, taking, you're going to take my job soon. Um, how long would that take to get through, I guess, different layers of approval? Like we were talking earlier and you were like, oh, it was 1984, 85, 86 that they were doing some of these studies. Yeah. Are we talking the same 20 year window or is this something if I, I invent something that ultimately ends up being that, how long until it's actually out in the market? So we're getting better and better at that. You know, uh, it takes about a billion dollars to get a drug <laughs> to market. Very inefficient and big pharma uh, has uh, had to spend a lot of money to get about, I think one in 10 drugs makes it to market or, or even less. Um, with this first immune drug that sort of started this revolution, we put it in humans for the first time in 2000 was approved in 2010. That was an extraordinarily fast yeah, yeah. 10 year. The second immune drug uh, that is probably even a bigger game changer took about six years. Wow. So with these immune ther therapies, because their effects have been so profound, we may not need quite as many patients to get it. But having said all that, patients have to participate in clinical trials. 
and we need to get information to understand how these drugs work, what their side effects are, yeah. and it's truly a collaborative process. I will say that you know it, it was true that it used to be like a billion dollars for a drug, or some I even saw three billion dollars from sure. somebody from one of the major pharma companies, but that was because so many drugs failed. With immunotherapy, the drugs that have been recently approved. They've had 15 of 16 phase three clinical trials led to were, were successful and led to approvals. So there hasn't been that fallout rate. So that's really changed. The other big component is that the FDA, the FDA and the Oncology Center of Excellence that was re recently recon reconstrued to bring all these groups together, I think they've been working very collaboratively. And so Rick, under the leadership of Rick Pazder, who's the head of the Oncology Center of Excellence, there are teams of people across the FDA that are really aggressively working to try and promote and accelerate the rate at which agents are being approved. And so if you have an agent that works, even with probably two phase two clinical trials, they're gonna be able to lead to approval. So I think that the, it is really changing and it's because they're very dedicated people. The FDA gets a bad, bum rap a lot of times, but they work their, their rear ends off, right, to, yeah. to turn things around within 30 days to get us back information and really help us push on these translational clinical trials. And so it's a partnership with them. Yeah. And I think some of the problem has been that historically with chemotherapy agents, you know, the incremental benefit was tiny. Yeah. And so, you know, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm to bring more drugs on the market that had very minimal effects on overall survival. These immune drugs have been game changers because they they really produce long-term. The FDA has embraced that. I would agree, uh, Dr. Pazder and his group have, in the last decade, and particularly in the last four or five years, have really accelerated working with our organizations, the Immune uh, mm -hmm. Society of Immunotherapy and others, really listen to what our needs are, us listening to what their needs are to protect yeah. you know, the safety of patients, and but get the best drugs. But it's much easier if you have a good yeah, drug. If true. it works, it gets on the market much quicker if it doesn't work. One that's of the true. limitations, though, has been that the, the future is going to be combinations. But there's been this reticence from the pharma companies to combine things together because they're worried about side effects. You heard Dr. Day talk about yeah. some of the immune side effects you have. And as you boost the immune system more, you're likely gonna have more immune side effects. But those are the trials that are gonna be the most effective. Uh, uh, yeah. That's my bet, that's my belief, right? And that's where we've gotta be. All the data for the last 30 years has showed us that as you combine these agents together, you're gonna to get more effective treatments in animal models. And, and we have an incredible animal research facility as part of the health system, mm -hmm. which, is what, which is what you've gotta to do to move these combinations into patients. But now we've got this information, we know how it works, we finally got pharmaceutical partners willing to give us drugs to do combinations. We've got program project grants that we're doing across between the John Wayne Cancer Institute, Swedish and our own. We're putting in proposals mm -hmm. to try and do more of this. That's gonna be the future. And that's what I think the hope is for the Providence St. Joseph Health System is that we'll have the access to these kinds of reagents. And if you're, for our listeners out there that you know may in the future get diagnosed, inevitably somebody will, or obviously somebody with a family, um, how do they participate in these clinical trials? And when is it right for being your advice? Meaning that if, assume even if you, you were in their, their shoes, how do you decide, hey, how do you find out about them? If I'm a patient and I am diagnosed with cancer and I'm like, I want to try something new. I wanted, I've heard this is working or, you know, we've been trying those things. Um, when is the right, to, how do you find out about them and when do you know if it's the right time for you? And also if assume there's a new thing that nobody has tried, how do you get find per, people to participate in, in some of those trials? Well, I think the first message is if you get cancers, obviously um, to, if you have a personal doctor already, obviously you want to leverage that doctor in terms yeah. of helping you get to the best referral specialist in cancer and each disease has centers of excellence that may put you down. Providence is a broad system that has lots of resources and we have three uh, major centers of excellence in, in Portland and Seattle and Los Angeles. So the key is to get to centers of excellence. Those doctors will be able to be most tapped into clinical trials and whether they have it in their particular center or they have access and collaborate not only within the Providence but outside. I, uh, they'll get you to the best possible treatment. And, and part of the vision, I think, for this unified health system under one medical record is that clinical trials will be able to export clinical trials to all the sites, right? So it's not there yet. It's going to take a while. We don't have 
Dr. Stephen O'Day, you know, <laughs> yeah. cloned in all those spots, right? But that's sort of the vision. As we talk yeah. about what the vision is for the health system, it is to take and, and, and make export out the trials that we can. There will always be trials that have to be at yeah. a major center. But there are other trials we can probably work with the centers to educate the physicians so that we can offer clinical trials, really relevant, great trials awesome. for patients at, at any place. Great information right here. We are here on the Red Pill with Dr. Fox and Dr. O'Day. I'm DJ Ski. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. We are back with Dr. Fox and Dr. O'Day. I'm DJ Ski. This is the Red Pill talking about cancer research in conjunction with Providence St. Joseph Health. Now, let's talk about how celebrities bring awareness to cancer when they experience it. Like, for example, you know, Angelina Jolie, Steve Jobs, very high profile people. Um, when this happens, how does this, uh, I guess, what does this mean for your research work? So obviously we hate to see anyone get cancer, but obviously when a celebrity gets cancer, there's tremendous opportunity to leverage that. But number one, they're bringing uh, their vulnerabilities forward and educating, and that's a huge, huge uh, asset to patients with cancer to feel like they're part of, of, of that and, and, and can get, seek treatment out themselves. Mm -hmm. The other thing, obviously, it, uh, you know, awareness is raised and funds. And the truth is that cancer research is still very underfunded overall. I mean, the National Cancer Institute uh, uh, gives a lot of money for research, but it's been uh, you know, fairly flat in, in years, and Bernie can speak to that more. But obviously, we, we rely on, on grateful patients and philanthropy and other nonprofit organizations to really help fill in the gaps of innovative research in particular that needs, that is underfunded. And just to speak to philanthropy for a second, the impact of philanthropy is enormous because when you think of a scientist sitting down to write a grant, having that get submitted to the NCI, nine months later they get the results from that and it says you got to write it again. You spend another three months, you submit it, nine months later you're a year and a half, two years into it, and you're just now finding out whether or not your grant got funded. With philanthropy, many of the ideas that we have we can do tomorrow because the money is there and we can accelerate things. And I think one of the reasons we've been so successful is we've been able to, we've had a real cohort of great patients and other friends of the Cancer Center in Portland that have supported the biomedical research. They've endowed chairs. I'm the Harder Family Chair for Cancer Research. But we've got other chairs, right? And, and, and those are the people that have actually made such a huge difference in our, in our institute. And I think both of our centers have, have done that, uh, particularly if you have translational research in the laboratory, grateful patients, clinical trials, and uh, foundation staff that really helps us uh, people have to feel a, a compelling story, they have to feel passionate, but the dollars given in philanthropy can be used so quickly and with novel, innovative trials, pilot studies that then can get funded later by bigger organizations. But so many young researchers yeah. can't even get off the ground because of the limited funds and the competitive nature of those funds on a national level. I'm sure. Is there any specific place that our listeners could, could donate that you guys would recommend for um, donations based off of the, uh, you guys' experience? Because people want to make sure that it's going to the right places. They see so many different options and opportunities. Is there somewhere that you guys would send our listeners? You know, it's dangerous to say in the health system, but, but certainly the health system. I think uh, there, I think I, I look back to the Child's Research Institute and the Franz Cancer Center. I'm sure the John Wayne Cancer Institute, but I would say I also serve on the Council for the American Cancer Society. They do a great job of reviewing and trying to get funding great. to the centers. So that's another great source of, uh, the, or a great spot to be donating money to. That's great. And what about availability of these new drugs and even some of these treatments? We hear about the high cost of certain drugs and that it's only available to certain people. Do you see that being the future, potentially, even if there's a cure where it is, you know, and especially people will say, oh, well, the drug companies will find a way to, you know, make people sick or they don't want to find a cure because they want to overpopulate them. What would be your response to that? And is this something that is going to be available, some of these uh, medications to uh, and treatment options to everybody, or is it going to be something that's only for people that can afford that? So, so one, I will say first that, that pharm people at pharmaceutical companies are like the rest of us, right? They've got loved ones who've got cancer, who have died from cancer. They're, they're in it because, because they want to make a difference. I mean, the ones I know, they're in it to make a difference. The same with the NCI, the same with the FDA, and at institutes all over the world are the same. That's the part about this global effort. So I don't buy that for a second. So people are paranoid if they're thinking that. Two is that the, the, the problem with cost is a real problem and we've got to deal with it. We're not dealing with it effectively. Somebody's got to deal with it, and, and that's got to come up, right? So, so the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, again, 
ran a program last year about how we're going to deal with this high cost of, of medical care. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a problem. I don't have the answer for it, yeah. but we got to get smart people working on it. Probably Dr. Day is the answer. <laughs> but it's really that balance, though, too. There is, like, the reason that medicine does cost this much, especially new medication, is because of the costs that go into it. You're talking yes. about billions of research, and you're not just paying for that medication. You're paying for the other <laughs> 10 failed pieces alongside that that... You, it's chicken in the air. And remember, you have to offset that cost with the cost of dying of cancer, and those yeah. costs are, are excessive. So there's cost issue. There's also access issue, yeah. which you know I think underserved populations in the U.S. Uh, have had difficulty getting access always uh, to certain drugs. In Providence system, we're trying very hard to to have centers of excellence and hubs, but also get some of these research trials and new drugs out into more community-based practices. So that's going to be very important. And I think as we get smarter about the design of clinical trials, there's another effort that both the AAC, American Association for Cancer Research and FDA and SITSI have been working on to do clinical trials smarter. They'll know when to kill a drug faster and not have as many failures. So as I said, there have been 15 of 16 successes. And there hasn't been this fallout, huge fallout in drug development. That's going to really lead to lower cost drugs. And personalized medicine where we can get a biopsy right from the beginning and tailor the treatment that has a 90% exactly. chance of working. Right now, we still give lots of treatments yeah. that don't work, that are highly expensive. So it's all going to evolve, I think, into a more cost-effective system as we go forward. And hopefully, drug development costs will come down. And, and so there, the, are, there are good reasons that we didn't have all, all we couldn't tailor it before. Mm -hmm. But we now have science yeah. that's available to do a lot of what we're talking about. Some yeah. of it's still science fiction, yeah. but a lot of it we can do. It's, it's getting closer. Anyways, yeah. um, speaking of celebrities, we were just talking about people. And Cheryl Crow is one per, one artist that's been specifically outspoken about that. She's got a song called Make It Go Away about her cancer journey. We're going to play that in a second for a break. How important is it for um, people that go through these situations, though, to, to spread the knowledge, uh, acknowledge them, and, and help, you know, I guess, uh, does this help awareness for you guys when you guys see things like that? We talked about celebrities coming out. It's overall a good thing when people use their voices to spread the word, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally, yes. That's so great. I applaud uh, any celebrity or anyone with cancer being more vocal, helping educate others, and participating in fundraising. And it's not just celebrities, but cancer patients have, have been brave and courageous and come forward. Mm -hmm. And you know, once they adjust to the diagnosis, they, they find ways to help. It's great. Dr. O'Day, Dr. Fox, we'll be right back. It's The Red Pill. I'm DJ Ski. Let's play some Cheryl Crow right now. Now, Dr. O'Day, so what is next in, in your eyes? You know, cancer research and immunotherapy is just exploding. And we're, we're lucky enough with uh, Dr. Fox and their center up in Portland. And the John Wayne Cancer Institute had a similar story in the early 90s, left UCLA. And Don Morton was the big surgeon, melanoma surgeon who left and set up shop at our, our hospital at St. John's. And we have had, since then, translational research, clinical research, excellent patient care, education, and philanthropy. And that's been a magical mix. We've done, we've been out of the box in terms of our thinking. We've led international trials. We've been at the forefront in a very small institution. Immunotherapy now is front and center. And we're just looking forward to working within the Providence system and with Dr. Fox and Dr. Irby and their groups up in Portland. There's tremendous power in our collaboration, but also we're centers that have been there before it was popular. And I think there's a real mission to keep staying bold, keep asking questions, don't sit on our laurels because patient care and better treatments is where we need to be. I've, I've learned so much from both you and Dr. Fox. Thank you guys so much for coming up here and sharing your uh, knowledge with our audience as part of this Red Pill series in conjunction with Providence St. Joseph Health. I'm DJ Ski signing out. Dr. Fox, Dr. O'Day, you guys have a great day. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Thank Take you. care.